Healthcare is the largest sector of the U.S. economy, accounting for 17.3% of GDP. And this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, having worked on the Affordable Care I'm just going to keep talking. I, I know that there's peop other people talking. Uh, Affordable Care Act uh, in the Obama administration when I was in uh, the uh, Council of Economic Advisors 14 years ago. Even though the healthcare landscape has changed significantly since then, there are a lot of inefficiencies in our healthcare system, which accounts for a much larger share of GDP here than in any other industrialized country. Our panelists today are going to drill down on many of the most important aspects and discuss some short-term fixes and longer-term solutions that policymakers can consider. Our moderator for this next session is my friend and Stanford colleague, Maria Polyakova. Maria is one of CEPR's faculty fellows and is an assistant professor of health policy at Stanford School of Medicine. Her research investigates questions surrounding the role of government in the design and functioning of health insurance systems. She is especially interested in the relationship between public policies and individual decision making in healthcare and health insurance, as well as in the risk protection and redistributive aspects of health insurance systems. I'm also very happy to report that just a week or two ago, Maria earned tenure here at Stanford. So that is like a very Thank good, Thank you. very, uh, we are all very happy, super well deserved, and we're so proud to have uh, supported Maria and her research during her time, much of her time here at Stanford. So I'm incredibly grateful to Maria for moderating this next panel. I know she's going to lead our panelists through a great conversation, so thanks so much, Maria, and take it away. Thank you so much, Mark, for the generous introduction. It is my privilege to have the opportunity to moderate this fantastic discussion. We have amazing speakers lined up for you today. Um, before I introduce them, let me just uh, repeat a couple of things that Mark said uh, while people more, were moving around. So why are we talking about healthcare today? This week, Drew Altman, the president and the CEO of Kaiser Family Foundation, actually wrote, well, this election is not going to be about health care. At the same time, he also points out that KFF polls suggest that health care costs are at the top of public's list of financial worries. Nearly three in four American adults, regardless of their party affiliation, are worried about being able to afford the cost of health care services. U.S. healthcare spending has reached $4.5 trillion, or more than $13,000 on average per person per year. And as Mark said, as a share of the GDP, health accounts for more than 17% of the economy. This is almost twice as much as in many other wealthy countries, yet we tend to do worse in terms of outcomes. So a discussion about the future of the healthcare system today is as needed as it has been ever. It is therefore my great pleasure to introduce our three fantastic speakers who will help us understand the landscape on, and what may lie ahead in the next years for healthcare. Our first speaker today will be Guy Wollstone. Guy received his PhD in economics right here at Stanford and then worked as a staff economist in the Obama White House as a consultant in the BCG's healthcare practice, as director of data science for Nuna Health and as a VP of analytics for CMS Health. Today, he serves as Connecticut's Medicaid director, where he oversees the policy operations for the health insurance program that, and I want to underscore that, that covers one in four of Connecticut's residents. So I'm very much looking forward um, in uh, him sharing his experience with the Medicaid program and how he sees it's evolving. Our second speaker is Amy Finkelstein. Amy is a health economist and the John and Jenny McDonald Professor of Economics at MIT. She's also the co-director of the Economics of Health program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, of the Institute of Medicine, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, of the Econometric Society, and of any other place you can think of <laughs> where the best health economist in the country should be in. Amy has received a lot of awards and fellowships. I will not be listing all of them today including a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship and the John Bates Clark Medal given to the most significant contributions in, of economic thought and knowledge. Amy, together with a fellow Stanford economist, Liran Ainev, 
has just recently released a book on how to reboot the American healthcare system. So hopefully she will tell us more about that today. So last but definitely not least, we will hear from Todd Park. Todd is the co-founder and executive chairman of Devoted Health, which focuses on improving the health and well-being of older Americans. Prior to Devoted, Todd served as the US Chief Technology Officer, White House Technology Advisor based in Silicon Valley, and the CTO of the US Department of Health and Human Services under President Barack Obama. Prior to his work in government, Todd co-founded a pioneering health information technology company, Athena Health, and a health benefit platform company, Castlight Health. He has been recognized as one of Fast Company's most creative people in business and by Rock Health as disruptive founder of the year. With that, I'm looking forward to some of their first remarks and then we'll uh, move to a discussion. Great, thanks so much. It's really great to be back at Stanford. Thanks for those remarks, Maria. I'll uh, begin by just saying a few words on Medicaid, the part of the US health insurance system that I help run in Connecticut. So Medicaid is health insurance for low-income people, it covers a lot of people. It's the biggest insurer in America. 41% of children have their birth financed by Medicaid. And at last check, 85 million people were on Medicaid. All that care is expensive. Last year, we spent $800 billion on the Medicaid program. In my opening remarks today, I want to focus on three incremental improvements to help make the US health insurance system work better in general, with a particular focus on Medicaid. And I hope that these ideas will have some bipartisan appeal. The first is on creating incentives for health insurers to invest in preventative care. The US health insurance markets are characterized by switching. You switch your insurer typically when you get a new job, when you move, when you have a kid, when you retire, when your income goes up, when your income goes down. In fact, every three years, about half of people switch health insurance, and in pockets of Medicaid, that switching is much more common. Well, Econ 101 would teach you that when your customers are frequently switching, that dulls your financial incentives to make investments, things that are expensive in the short run, but may have savings and health improvements in the long run. And I can say at multiple places where I've worked in my career, I see this in spades. There can be interventions that improve health and have the potential to lower cost, for example, helping get people who are undiagnosed with conditions treated. Uh, and they work well clinically, but they really suffer financially because all of that testing and all that treatment drives up costs in the short run, and the savings are likely to be incident on the insurer's competitors if people switch. So what's the fix? Well, I think now we have the technology and the tools to follow people longitudinally across their lives when they switch health insurers. I think it would be great to give health insurers incentives to reduce potentially avoidable spending in the handful of years after they switch. I think that simple tweak would substantially ramp up the incentives for health insurers to invest in prevention. A second one is on the use of evidence, and in particular, randomized control trials, or RCT, something Amy has been thinking a lot about. Um, in healthcare, as in life, many ideas that sound really good on paper don't actually work. <laughs> and conversely, uh, even things that are very successful can be made incrementally better through experimentation and tinkering. Parts of the US healthcare system have embraced randomized control trials completely. Think pharmacy, pharmaceutical design. Other parts, not at all. And I think there is great potential in bringing the power of credible evaluation and measurement to the rest of the healthcare system. The thing I'll focus on is care management, basically helping sick people, often low-income people, navigate the healthcare system. As someone who's both developed those programs and also now buys them as the Medicaid director in Connecticut, I can assure you it is the Wild West. There is almost no evidence base for many of the programs, and it's very difficult for me to distinguish things that work from snake oil. Uh, in Connecticut, we're helping to build an evidence team to help test and learn to see what works and what doesn't, to scale things that are effective and to stop doing things that are ineffective. But I know from working in the trenches in the states, it's really challenging for a typical state to do this work. States often don't have the talent or the resources to do this evaluation, and evaluation and measurement is what economists would call a public good. So what's the fix? Well, I think there are at least two. Um, first, uh, private philanthropy, I think, can really play a role. Small amounts of money can help particularly government insurers figure out what works and what doesn't, and the, the return on that investment, I think, is incredibly high. Um, I also think the feds can play a role. So I think the federal government, and Medicaid in particular, could demand that states use randomized control trial as a condition for approving their so-called demonstration waivers. The feds could subsidize this innovation, 
And they also could introduce the equivalent of nutrition labels for care management programs, helping purchasers understand the evidence base or lack thereof. Those are three low or no cost interventions that I think would really help push the Medicaid sector and healthcare sector more generally to use evidence. Um, finally, I'll just touch a little bit on nudging. Um, so healthcare is really complicated. I don't know if you, if you know that. Um, and I don't know how many of you, um, to take one example, uh, choosing a, a primary care provider, a PCP. I don't know how many of you have ever moved to a new city and your new health insurer might ask you, pick a doctor. And you're like, I have no idea. Um, well, in Medicaid, that's a particularly consequential choice for many Medicaid members because many Medicaid members are on gatekeeper HMO style plans where their PCP controls the specialists and tests that they have access to. In focus groups that I've done with Medicaid members, uh, when you ask them, how do you pick your doctor? Often I get a blank stare or it's a haphazard, pick something at the top of the alphabet, et cetera. And in fact, many Medicaid plans literally randomly assign members to primary care doctors who happen to practice nearby where they live. We can do better. Um, at a startup I once worked at, we built tools to help match members to primary care doctors who are right for them. Um, think, for example, if you have diabetes, matching you to a PCP who has a statistical track record at helping people be adherent to their care regimens. Uh, those nudges we showed through randomized controlled trials can lower costs, likely improve quality. I think this general idea of making it easy for people to make smart choices, especially when the choices are hard, could be applied much more broadly, um, especially in the government space. So I'm thinking, for example, choosing health plans, selecting doctors like PCPs and specialists, choosing a hospital, choosing a nursing home, deciding whether care at home versus a nursing home is right for you. Those are just some examples of places where nudging, I think, could really work. So those are three ideas, uh, more incentives for prevention, uh, better use of evidence and nudging that I think uh, could really help get the US a little closer to some of our rich peers in terms of bringing down costs and improving outcomes. Thanks. Amy? Uh, thanks. It's, uh, it's very hard to, to talk about what I came here to talk about after Guy spoke because I am, of course, a, as he mentioned, a huge fan of randomized trials in general and in healthcare in particular. And in fact, uh, an organization that I run, JPL North America, which is devoted to doing that, is partnering with the state of Connecticut's Medicaid program to try to embed and encourage this, and I'm always up for a good randomized trial. But what I'm going to uh, instead be talking about today is, I think we titled our session uh, from, from Small Steps to Giant Leaps. Guy gave you some very practical, immediately implementable, and I think very, very sensible proposals. I'm going to give you, uh, as, as Maria alluded, uh, a brief overview of our new book with uh, Laurent Einiv, who most of you probably know as the chair of the economics department at Stanford, but also occasionally does some research as well. That was a joke. Um, uh, um, on uh, how, to, how, to, how to radically redesign US health insurance to improve it. Uh, we have no illusions of what we're proposing is uh, immediately uh, politically implementable, but we also have no concerns about that because we think it is extremely important as academic economists to try to articulate the ideal or the North Star, either so that we're ready with that good idea as when, as Milton Friedman said, the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable, or when there are people like Guy and many others actually working in the trenches to get things done, if we can at least ag agree on the North Star, then we can, they can figure out which of the many compromises they have to make are more or less consequential. And since I only have five minutes, I'll have to just encourage you all to buy the book. Um, <laughs> but to give you a very brief overview, um, we start by articulating some of the problems that we think don't get enough attention. The fact that there are 30 million uninsured Americans is a real problem, and that's also widely discussed. But as, as Guy alluded to, this, this problem of churn, of people losing coverage, is, is also a really big concern. We estimate that as many Americans who are uninsured at a point in time will an additional, that same number, will lose coverage over a two-year period because, as Guy said, they lose their job, they change jobs, they get older, they get poorer, they get richer, they age, et cetera. And so, you know, that's not what, again, Econ 101, health insurance is supposed to do. It's supposed to be providing security, and instead it's highly insecure. Um, 
Guy pointed out some of the problems that has for investment incentives. We focus in our book not on the huge problem of healthcare spending and health outcomes, but on just how to improve the insurance coverage given the existing uh, healthcare technology. Uh, and also, as, as he also alluded to, or I think Maria did in her opening remarks, that um, when, when she talked about how three, three in four Americans are concerned about the financial consequences of healthcare. There's an enormous amount of medical debt. Actually, Neil Mahoney, our, the, the new super director, has done some of the best work on this. But it turns out most of that medical debt is actually incurred by people who have health insurance at the time they're incurring that medical expenses. But they have uncapped out-of-pocket expenses or high deductibles. So those are the kinds of problems we want to fix, not just the uninsured, but problems that affect the 90% of Americans who are fortunate enough to have insurance at any given moment. And what we do is we say, well, if we're going to fix them, we have to decide what is the goal, what is the purpose of health policy. And often, you know, my limited impression, at least from reading the news, I have not spent time in, in, in D.C., at least in the last 25 years, um, is that, uh, you know, people are arguing about their favorite policy or slogan, Medicare for all, health savings accounts, single payer, what have you, but never, try, never agreeing or discuss, even articulating what is the goal, what are we trying to achieve with this policy. And so what we argue in depth in the book is that the history of U.S. health policy as well as our current policies makes very clear that there is a unwritten but very real social contract to try to provide access to essential medical care regardless of resources. And many of our incredibly inefficient, convoluted patches for how to uh, get low-income individuals medical care when they fall ill, most of which are publicly financed, are, are the unfortunate result of our, uh, our failure to, to fulfill that obligation. And so therefore, in the third part of the book, we articulate the solution, which if you agree with us, and if you don't, once again, or even if you do, I urge you to buy the book, um, <laughs> once you agree with us that that is a key purpose of health insurance policy to ensure a basic floor of essential uh, access to essential medical care for everyone, the solution we propose is something that we think is actually quite obvious, and, and as witness thereof, it's actually something that's been embraced already uh, for decades, if not centuries, by people across the political spectrum, including famously free market economists like Hayek, uh, libertarians like Charles Murray, Republican uh, uh, governor and senator uh, Mitt Romney, as well as liberals like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which is to have if you, if you are going to ultimately you know, fund people's essential care when they fall ill and can't afford it, we might as well formalize that commitment and fund it up front uh, through automatic universal coverage. So our proposal is two parts. The first part to fulfill that commitment is automatic, universal, free, but basic coverage, an emphasis on the basic, that's what's gonna keep the cost to the taxpayer down. Think something closer to Medicaid for All, the program that uh, Guy runs, rather than the slogan Medicare for All, with then a key distinction, which is we are going to allow and design it in a way to allow for a robust supplemental private market for anyone who wants to and can afford more than the basic. They can essentially uh, take the money that would have been spent for their, say, Medicaid for all policy and use it as a voucher for their private insurer, whether through an employer or not, to get something that's, that's you know, has more coverage, uh, lower wait times, more choice of doctor, uh, but ensuring that everyone has that basic coverage and they have no risk of losing that uh, should they change jobs, get older, get uh, richer or poorer, et cetera. So I think that's about my five minutes and, and I'll stop there. Uh, happy to discuss it more later. Amy for president. <laughs> <laughs> so a huge plus one to what Guy said and what Amy said. Um, what I'll do is I'll just add a perspective uh, from the trenches. Um, uh, and just give you an example of work that's happening in the trenches um, against these problems that we've been talking about. So uh, Devoted Health was founded by my brother Ed and I in 2017. <clears throat> it's a very simple mission, which is to dramatically improve the health and well-being of older Americans by caring for every single person like they're literally our own family. And if you think about like, what would you want for healthcare for your own family, you would presumably want the best healthcare in the world, right? You wouldn't sell for anything less. And it turns out you can very precisely define what the best healthcare in the world is. It's the right care, both clinical and non-clinical, including social determinants, delivered in the right place at the right time in a highly consistent 
coordinated and proactive way. If you've ever been a patient in the status quo American healthcare system or cared for a loved one who is, you know, what I just said is definitely not the status quo experience of healthcare in America, right? That's an experience that is highly fragmented, uncoordinated, disorganized, and sentiment misaligned, information poor, confusing as hell, high friction, reactive, and non-prevention oriented. That's not the fault of the doctors in the system. My wife's a doctor. She's better than me at everything. <laughs> and if you ask a doctor, they say the nurses are even better, right? But the doctors and nurses are laboring in a system that almost seems to be an anti-system, right? It seems to almost be actively conspiring <laughs> against doctors and nurses uh, in terms of trying to actually get people the best care. And that's what the doctors want to do, and the system does not support that. Um, as a result, Americans don't tend to get the right care up front, infamously, and therefore Americans experience way too many hospitalizations and other catastrophes that should have been avoided, which is a major contributor to why America, as you've heard, spends more than double per capita what the rest of the developed world spends on healthcare with uh, outcomes, preventable illness and death, that rank at the very bottom, right? So uh, uh, the good news uh, is that over the last several decades, brave, iconoclastic local innovators at different points in the American space-time <laughs> went against the grain and said, this is crazy. <laughs> Let's actually try to get people the right care up front and to coordinate when and see what happens, right? And what they demonstrated, uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt, is if you actually get people the right care up front, then outcomes do this and costs do this basically, uh, because as your grandmother would say, a stitch in time saves nine. If you get people the right care up front, they stay as healthy and well as possible and out of the really expensive hospital. So what DeVoe's doing is taking that age-old wisdom and combined it with what technology can do in the early 21st century to have built the first solution uh, that can hyperscale that kind of right care up front to everyone everywhere. And to do that, uh, we, uh, <laughs> leveraging a quarter century of working in healthcare, learning lessons mostly the hard way. We actually came to understand the only way to do this, the only way to do it is to build an alternate universe, full stack, tech-enabled American healthcare system as a service. You have to build the whole doggone thing. Otherwise, you will be defeated in your mission by some legacy pathology and legacy system. So we built something we call an all-in-one healthcare solution. And it consists of five ingredients all of which we deeply masochistically built from scratch, but you have to do that because you have to craft every single detail of the system to support getting people the right care up front. So just very quickly, we built our own in-house health insurance plan, which is again, deeply crazy, but if you don't control that layer and the funding and how people are paid and the benefits and the data, then you're totally screwed basically in terms of the ability to get people the right care up front. So we built that to support people getting the right care. We built our own in-house navigator service uh, that uh, essentially concierges each member through their healthcare journey. We partner locally, ingredient number three, with great local doctors and hospitals, and we love them all. But as we talked about, what those folks were really built to do is acute care. So when the fit hits the shan, if you've got the right health insurance and the right navigation, they're like really good at helping you, right? The problem is, is that they're not really supported, to, uh, not really, uh, 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 really built to prevent catastrophe. So ingredient number four is we built our own full-scale in-house virtual first medical group, devoted to employ clinicians of all kinds. And they don't replace your primary care doctor. Uh, they don't replace any of your doctors because people don't want that, but rather they fill in the gap of preventive care. They actually do 21 additional services, 95% uh, telemedically, 5% at home, that essentially very few American primary doctors have the ability to do. Because uh, your average American primary doctor, if you have one, uh, can see you for like 10 minutes every few months, like maybe. Right? They can't do 21 additional things that are really, really, really important to do to help people, right? Deep, ongoing, comprehensive diagnosis assessment, uh, chronic illness management, intensive home care for the super sick, palliative care, urgent care, uh, transitions of care management from hospital to home, uh, behavioral health, huge gap, et cetera. So we built a set of 21 services that wrap around the care that your doctor can give you to essentially deliver high-touch, high-tech, concierge-like care to people at home 95% virtually. And then all of this is running on software that we built from scratch uh, that runs everything I just said uh, and is a right care, right place, right time machine. So it's constantly building a profile of you from thousands of different sources and then constantly analyzing that profile, increasingly with AI, to answer a very simple question. What do you need next? And then the software is choreographing behind the scenes the often incredibly complicated logistics of the health insurance plan, the navigator, your doctor, our doctors, our nurses, our educators, our nutritionists coming together so the very simple thing pops out at the end for you. The next right care step for you. And the next one, and the next one, including a bunch of stuff 
that you never would have asked for, but turns out to be a stitch time safe knot. So we're the only people nutty enough to even attempt to build what I just said from a blank sheet of paper. Uh, we've now built it. And what's happening is a little crazy. <laughs> we feel like we've kind of split the atom and are now witnessing a phenomenon <laughs> that uh, is a system where every element is actually aligned to get people the right care up front. And that's manifesting in uh, radical improvement in member experience, so net, promo net promoter score, uh, basically people, uh, 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 people's happiness level of 77, uh, which is a higher satisfaction level than Apple, Starbucks, Amazon, USAA, Netflix, et cetera. Uh, clinical outcomes that are pretty crazy <laughs> in terms of uh, how, uh, how uh, high performing uh, uh, they are. Uh, and then significant reductions in cost by avoiding a whole bunch of acute care. Um, and reductions that we've measured through synthetic propensity match control groups, but we look forward to actually uh, <laughs> analyzing with Amy's help with RCTs, um, uh, but uh, which directionally indicates um, what is actually something that's commonsensical, which is if you get people comprehensively the right care up front, you save a whole bunch of money by reducing the rate of catastrophe, uh, hospitalizations, surgeries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so um, we actually are beginning to feel quite a lot of hope, actually, um, that change is in fact possible. Um, and uh, we are incredibly excited uh, to hear uh, the ideas and the, uh, about the initiatives um, that uh, folks like Guy and Amy are championing. Um, and just to kind of say amen to a couple things, we actually started with older Americans, A, because there's an epicenter of issue there, and B, because it is a universal health insurance program for the rest of your life. So we can actually sign someone up and then keep them forever, right? The number one thing blocking, devoted from bringing what it does to the under 65, uh, year old world is the fragmentation you described. Um, and then secondly, um, we believe to our core and rigorous analysis. Anecdote is not sufficient, right? Uh, 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 Non-disciplined quantitative analysis is not sufficient. Um, and so um, we are incredibly excited to bring more and more firepower to bear uh, to, uh, to help improve our analysis. Um, and Amy has agreed to, 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 to counsel us on how to help us um, actually, I sent her one of uh, our papers on our intensive home care program in advance, and it was like Taylor Swift agreeing to read the song you'd written right, <laughs> in your, your, your garage, right? And she said, yeah, it's very intriguing, very promising, but I recommend RCTs. <laughs> Let's talk about that. So after this, we're going to talk about that, uh, and I'm super excited about that. Uh, but such a thrill to be on stage with the three of you, and thank you so much for, for inviting me. Thank you so much, everyone. So Todd, actually, let me pick up on one of the things that you've mentioned, which is you know, how you are finding with Devoted that it's um, exciting to work with the universal health within the universal health insurance program. Yeah. So one thing, I guess, staying a little bit on the big picture, Amy, I, I guess you guys don't quite speak in your book about the role of private entities in the grand strategy of universal health insurance. And in both Medicare, which is the space where Devoted is working, as well as in Medicaid, managed care plans and private entities play an enormously important role. And that's not necessarily the case in kind of many proposals that people think about when they think Medicare for all or Medicaid for all or any of the slogans. How do you see the role of private companies? I'm curious about your North Star version and then sort of the practical version from Guy and Todd. You don't think I can do practical? <laughs> you know, I, I was her thesis advisor, so she knows just how impractical I am. Uh, um, so this is a great question. I, I want to be clear that we try very hard to be clear on what both is essential for fulfilling what we view as this failed attempt to fulfill our social contract and where things are up for grabs in the sense of reasonable people can disagree, even unreasonable people can disagree as well. Uh, and, and on the subject of private versus <clears throat> public delivery, I th that's very much one of them. So what you can see from countries around the world is you can introduce you know, a, and by the way, what we're proposing really is just some version of what every other high income country has, which is a automatic universal basic system and then the ability to supplement it if you want it. We're just gonna do it really well. Um, but that universal basic can be 
provided through a single uh, public, single public payer with publicly employed physicians and hospitals, uh, the way the British National Health Service does it, the way also uh, we do it in the US in the Veterans Administration and the health services for our veterans, or it can be provided through uh, a series of competing private insurers who uh, you know, themselves contract with private, private you know, physicians and uh, hospitals, the way the health insurance exchanges in the US work, the way universal basic coverage in countries like Switzerland and the Netherlands currently work. So we're, we're fairly agnostic on that. I think there are pros and cons of each. The other thing I should be clear we're agnostic on is how to deal with the other major problem in US healthcare that everyone's been talking about, namely how to dramatically reduce healthcare spending without harming patient outcomes. We all know how to reduce healthcare spending. You can close hospitals, but that's not the goal. The goal is to cut the waste. There's widespread agreement that there's enormous amount of waste in US healthcare, you know, something like 30 to 40% of medical spending is estimated to be waste, but it's sort of like that old adage about advertising. Everyone agrees that half of advertising spending is wasted. They just don't agree which half, right? And so I think it's, it's been, we sort of said, you know, for our reading of the evidence is it's been very hard to find, you know, programs that, you know, change how care is delivered, how payment is structured, that actually can reduce spending without compromising outcomes. So I was actually thrilled to hear Todd say something that once he said it was so ex post obvious, but that honestly I had not thought of, which is the same start from scratch approach that we had been taking to the insurance system may in fact be what we really need to do for healthcare delivery. Because certainly the history of the last 40 to 50 years are a series of healthcare reforms that uh, to reduce healthcare spending without harming patient outcomes or even improving them that have consistently failed to deliver on their promise. So I'm extremely excited to hear that people are not only thinking about but implementing much more radical, but potentially, therefore, much more beneficial solutions. Guy, do you have a sense or thoughts on the, the role of private players yeah, in it's, Medicaid it's, or yeah. more broadly? Yeah, and um, as Maria mentioned, there's been a huge increase both in the Medicare side and on the Medicaid side in the percent of people who are in private competing health plans um, in the US. And like Todd, I've worked both on both sides, both on the government side and on the on the, in the private sector. And I would say my, my reading of the evidence is very much in line with Amy's, that there isn't strong evidence that one is better than the other. Um, and I've, I've seen, in just personal experience, anecdotes, <clears throat> which may be a little weird from a data person, but I can see how stifling and slow working in a government can be, and what Latad is describing would be totally impossible um, inside um, the regime. I've also seen you know, better incentives uh, working in the government, less of the issues of churn, um, and switching, so I kind of have seen both. I guess my call to action would be, if we're going to continue to embrace private health insurance, like we do in the exchange, like we do in Medicare and Medicaid, to really think carefully about the incentives that we're setting, and I, I, I touched on one, the, the um, incentives for, for prevention. I think there are others, including how you set the benchmarks, risk adjustment, the quality scoring. I think there's good evidence that private plans are good at at, gaming this, at, at, at teaching to the test and, and kind of doing the things that the government compensates them on, which is great, but we just need to be really thoughtful about how we deploy those levers, kind of have an evil, even playing field. Makes sense. Todd, anything in your experience on the Medicare side? Yeah, I would Medicare say, I think just building on what, uh, what Amy and Guy were saying, um, I think uh, there is a, a double helix of awesomeness that is possible here with public-private, where the government sets the rules of the playing field, like defines the social goal, and configures the system with incentives to uh, basically incent achievement of that goal, and then unleash the power of private sector innovators to invent all kinds of new ways, uh, including ones completely out of left field, which are often the, the most impactful uh, uh, and helpful, uh, having uh, innovators invent all kinds of ways to achieve that goal, right? Um, and you know, it's, uh, I think, uh, also important to understand um, that any rule set uh, initially proposed for a system is incredibly unlikely to be optimal from birth. Uh, so it's incredibly important for government to think iteratively about that rule set and use data <laughs> from RCTs <laughs> um, to actually iterate that rule set, right? To continually tune, 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 tune the incentive field so that private sector innovation and capital like flows in the direction of what is good for society. So, one one, yeah, more, quick course, thing to, ahead, one more quick thing to add, just very much building on what you were saying, Todd. Um, this goes back a little bit to the third idea on nudging. 
I don't know how many of you have ever had a job or a context where you've had to choose a health insurance plan. It's really hard. I've like no idea. I've worked in this industry for a long time and I often really struggle. I think the, the type of default assignment or nudging, I think can be really powerful. There's, I think, pretty good research showing that your health insurer really matters. Even, even not the, the fancy, amazing stuff that Todd is doing, but even more run of the mill, Aetna versus Blue Cross versus whatever, um, can impact things like mortality in a, in a causal way. And I think um, helping people match to insurers that are good will help, obviously, people get the care that they need, and then will also give entrepreneurs incentives and ability to scale if they do have something successful. And I think there's a lot more to be explored in helping, helping with those, that, that guidance and nudging. So, so I guess picking up on the, on the question of sort of how, what is the role of government and what is the balance between government and private roles and the incentives. So it does seem like if we look at the policy changes that are happening, there is kind of uncertainty in the policymaking world of what the right balance is. So one of the big news of 2023 in healthcare was Medicare's decision to negotiate prices on behalf of the private, uh, what are currently private, private plans. Do you feel like, do you have a sense of where this is going? Are you expecting that we'll be able to achieve fantastic low drug prices with no unintended consequences or in, on innovation? Or what's, what's your guys' thought and whoever wants to speak th first? Feel free. <laughs> no. Um, I, so I think just, just to, there are many aspects of your question and I'm gonna leave the more subtle and harder ones to, to Guy and Todd in terms of you know, the details of this, the negotiation that's been worked out and what it will do to uh, drug prices. But we know from not only uh, Economics 101 basic theory, uh, but also from a uh, growing body of evidence, including work that uh, Mark Duggan has done, some that I've done myself, that, you know, it is true, it's not just a marketing line, that when, you, when, uh, when the expected returns to innovation decrease, uh, for-profit pharmaceutical companies invest less in innovation and you get fewer new drugs. Now, whether that is a good thing or a bad thing on net is a real question. It, you know, there's a trade-off between encouraging the next potential breakthrough drug and increasing uh, access to the current technologies that are available. And there's also no question that there's a lot of wasteful or duplicative innovation. But anyone who's standing up and telling you that we can lower drug prices without you know, reducing innovation is, is selling you snake oil. I largely, I largely agree. I, I'll just say way back when, um, uh, I used to help a little bit on the side pharmaceutical companies do exactly the calculations on should they invest in making a particular drug and the, there's, there's a line literally in the models of what do we think the chance that the federal government is going to negotiate prices uh, in the future and you know, that, that affects their investment decision. So I, I agree with So it's going up, the line, the importance uh, yeah, of the line is yeah, going up. Yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I defer to someone who runs the Medicaid program and a John Bates Clark medal winner. So <laughs> <laughs> what I would say though is that at uh, uh, another level, if there's a customer who buys a lot of something and you do not give that customer the ability to negotiate the price, I think you're missing a force that needs to be present. Um, and so uh, I think the introduction of said force, I say this as the junior member of this panel, okay? The introduction of that force, I think, is a good thing. Now, what the balance of that force is versus all the other forces, I think is a multivariate equation that should be solved um, for optimal social benefit. Um, but um, having an actor who buys a lot able to have some influence over the price, <laughs> I think, is actually probably good. Uh, again, need to balance that with lots of other forces as well, so. I mean, I you, as, as predicted, you took the harder question that I ducked, which was just to say, empirically, we know if you lower drug prices, there will be less innovation. The much more interesting and harder question, well, I certainly agree with you, there's no reason to give up the ability to negotiate. You could always choose not to, so that, that's a clear win. And the, and the, the harder question is how to you know, set the prices to, to get this balance right. There's no question that you know, what we currently do uh, it, by we, I mean the government, is either nothing in, for over-the-counter, for uh, uh, outpatient prescription drugs, which I agree with you, there's no reason to just tie our hands on that, 
Or, you know, for inpatient prescription drugs, the government says we'll pay 106% of the average, you know, private market price, which, you know, again, Mark's work has shown, what does that do? Well, then we raise the average private market price, particularly for drugs where the government is a large purchaser. So the recent uh, Aduhelm Alzheimer's drug, you know, the government was essentially going to be, you know, the entire market. So is it, you know, the only, th everyone was surprised when they came out with a $65,000 price. I was surprised, perhaps I take economic theory too seriously that they didn't set the price at infinity, right? Because like <laughs> the government was going to agree to pay, you know, they were the, they were 98% of the of the market and they were going to pay whatever price was set. Clearly you're going to set a really high price. So that is is not the way we should be going. T Todd's comment sparked a, um, a, a thought that I have as a, as a purchaser of, of a lot of prescription drugs. Um, and that's, in some sense, I do think there's ability, there's a bit of a missing market in pharmaceutical purchasing. So take something like anti-obesity medicines, uh, which are new and are highly effective and also really expensive. Mm -hmm. The clinical benefit of those drugs varies a lot based on who you are. If you're severely obese, there's huge clinical benefits, probably. If you're moderately obese, the benefits are much smaller. And the way uh, programs typically negotiate drugs, not in every case, but, but typically do, is they, they look at a single price. So, you know, the Connecticut Medicaid will sit down with, with, the, with the drug manufacturers and, and agree for a single price for, um, for those drugs. And, you know, if, if we price it high, then we'll, have, we'll only basically give the drug to very severely obese people. But that, in some sense, is leaving value on the table because there is a group of people who are moderately obese who would benefit somewhat from the drug where we'd be willing to pay some amount of money, but not the high price. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, th you know, there's there, there surplus that's being left on the table. And I think, there is, I think there's a lot of space for more of that value-based contracting based on the, the particular clinical financial benefits of a, of a really expensive drug for, um, for people. And I think that really should be um, explored further. That, that's a fabulous idea, you know, that we've had all this, I had never thought of it, but we've had all this, you know, movement towards value-based health insurance yeah. in which, you know, whether you're going to have a high copay or a low copay depends in part on how valuable we think the drug is. Why shouldn't there be value-based, you know, purchasing, yeah. value-based pricing yeah. by, by the government? Yeah. yeah. You actually previewed my, my next question, which is, I guess, taking a step back and thinking about new technologies more generally, a lot of them tend to be drugs. Yes. Um, you know, a lot of people now worry about the weight loss drugs hitting the market and that, like, essentially bringing bankruptcy to, to many health insurance plans. Um, I think the FDA is currently thinking of approving the weight loss drugs for heart indications because Medicare is not legally currently allowed to, uh, to cover weight loss uh, indications. Do you feel like at some point, and maybe Medicaid is already doing that, we'll have to be open and embrace cost effectiveness? So you talked about sort of efficacy of things, but at the end of the day, and you know, we say value-based care, and other countries just call it cost effectiveness. Right. They're right. just upfront. They say, right. here is our value Absolutely. of statistical life, and this is uh, what we think this technology is bringing. How do you view this in the US? I think there's huge opportunity um, there, and my colleagues can probably speak more to the international comparisons. I'll just say in, in, in Medicaid in particular, the details are a little bit complicated, but basically we need to cover every FDA approved drug with some rare exceptions, uh, period. Uh, we, have no, we have no ability to say, well, that drug is just a little bit more effective than, than this drug, um, we need to cover them all. And that, um, that, that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, we, we, we should be tying reimbursement uh, to, to value, not only kind of statically I think that will allow our dollars to go further, but then I'm also thinking about the dynamic implications, going back to the, the pharmaceutical companies, you know, a, a line in their model was not so much how much better is this drug going to be and therefore I'm going to get a lot more money. It was more like, can we market this? Can we sell it? Um, which is a, a, different, a different question. So I think there's a lot of value in mm -hmm. moving to paying based on, based on value rather than other metrics like, like a, a price that's set in the private market. Do you think that's politically feasible, cost effectiveness? Um, as a line in the elections? I'm not sure about my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I'll say is, I may be taking a different uh, uh, blends to it, um, is that uh, one really interesting feature of the Medicare Advantage program um, is that uh, there's a defined set of benefits that the Medicare benefits that you have to provide. But then if you can actually save money mm -hmm. uh, uh, in your delivery of that, then you can take a chunk of the savings and you can reinvest that in better benefits, right? benefits mm -hmm. beyond what Medicare covers, right? So we cover, for example, vision, dental, and hearing, 
which Medicare infamously doesn't cover. Um, and as one doctor said, like, everything goes in your body through this, this, and this. If this is working, this is not going to be good, right? So uh, interestingly, um, uh, one innovation that the Medicare Advantage program introduced a little while ago, a uh, really big deal, is a Medicare Advantage plan can now actually cover non-clinical benefits as long as you connect those non-clinical goods to a clinical outcome, uh, which is huge, right? Because uh, as uh, Dr. Mark Harrison, one of my mentors, uh, 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 shares, um, about 10% of someone's health status is determined by what a doctor or a hospital do within the walls of a medical office or hospital. About 30 to 40% is behavior, and the rest is social determinants, right? Food, housing, et cetera. Um, so one of the things that Devota does is one of our insurance benefits for our health insurance plan is we give you a card called the food and home card um, for uh, a very large swath of our members and we load it with money you can use for healthy food to pay for utilities or to pay your rent. Um, a, this is very popular with seniors. B, if someone has healthy food, can afford air conditioning, electricity, and or heat, and has a stable home, they're gonna be a hell of a lot healthier than if they don't, right? They're, they're, those are three wonder drugs, right? And in many cases, dwarf the impact of like a, a medication or, a, or, or, a, or an operation. So. Um, so I think you know, there is already a very interesting uh, opportunity within the Medicare program, uh, inside the Medicare Advantage program, right, to actually look at well, what are the high value things to cover and deliver, um, and then to innovate in what that is uh, toward actually better outcomes at lower cost. And Todd, just picking up on what you're saying, the U.S. spends much more on healthcare per capita than many other rich peer countries. We tend to spend less on social services broadly construed. One, I think there, there are multiple answers for why the U.S. spends so much on healthcare and has worse outcomes. Um, I think one potential uh, explanation uh, is that, exactly as you're saying, health is determined not only by healthcare but on social factors as well. And I just will flag it in Medicaid. There's a huge amount of innovation. I think without such a great evidence base of trying to work on that, on, on having um, tailored nutrition, food, um, housing, stuff like that. Um, and I'm excited to to push that forward. Sounds like a good subject for RCT. Yeah, agreed, <laughs> agreed. Well, let me ask what just one, <laughs> one last question before uh, we open to, to the broader audience. So I guess it seems that many states in the US are embracing many of the ideas that you guys have uh, touched upon and are trying to introduce state level universal health coverage bills. In fact, uh, it seems that nearly half of the states, including California, have already either attempted or are currently attempting such bills. And, many of them fail. Do you all feel like a state-based universal health coverage, whatever that may be, but it seems to address many of the issues we've just touched upon, is a feasible, like not politically feasible, but an actual feasible, uh, feasible solution that could work? I think it's such a great question. And going back to before the Affordable Care Act, um, I think as, as Amy or Todd mentioned, uh, Massachusetts had a version of Obamacare before, like Romney Care was basically, you know, Obamacare is pretty, pretty, pretty darn similar. And I, I do think if, I will admit, Amy, I've not yet purchased the book, I will, um, but I've heard your podcasts. Um, I, I do think some version of what Amy is describing, I think if it, if it takes place in even a single state for a couple of years, that, that is a proof of possibility that I, in, the, in the early days of the Obama administration, I think it was really helpful to be able to point to even a single state like Massachusetts. So I, I do think that's a fruitful place for, um, for, for reforms to, to spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say exactly the same thing. And I can, I can show you how to buy the book afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that note, um, I would love to open uh, it up to the Q&A from the audience. You will start. Okay. Um, anyone has any questions? We've got a question right here, back here. Uh, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, question to all of you is actually on this idea of healthcare messaging. And in each of your domains, how you've either looked into it or areas that you can think about to push your policies forward more. Uh, a common joke online to the, the last commentary here is uh, you'll look across the US and a lot of people will be very opposed to this um, Medicare for all, Medicaid for all, however you do it, collectively public option. But if you told everybody, hey, we make a very big Kickstarter that everybody puts a little bit into, 
and now you all get healthcare for free, people might accept that a little more. Kickstarter, surprisingly effective, if a bit sad, for a lot of medical care in the US. Um, but that aside, main question here is more on the messaging, things that you've looked into, or things that you'd recommend. Either of you guys, please go ahead. I mean, I'm gonna say that, you know, I think I'm the last person to give advice on messaging. I, uh, my, our real hope, particularly in writing a book that's designed to be readable and accessible to a general, you know, educated audience, is that if we can convince other people of our ideas, people far savvier and more skillful than we are, and in fact just savvy and skillful, period, <laughs> relative to us, uh, will figure out how to message it, how to and how also to you know package it uh, politically. It's a, it's a hugely important problem. I don't mean to belittle it. I just I also recognize you know where I'm out of my depth. Uh, thank you very much. This is uh, so interesting. Uh, I've read that uh, so much of our health outcomes are actually determined by the time we're 20 years old, uh, particularly with regard to behaviors. Uh, what recommendation, recommendations would you have for the educational system? starting at a young age, to inculcate not just information but appropriate values and, most importantly, behaviors so that in advance of senior years, uh, people live a healthy lifestyle and minimize those more dramatic interventions later on. Uh, that's such a great question. Um, uh, I'll start by saying um, it's never too late to change your behavior. Um, and so, for example, our uh, devoted diabetes management program, 83% uh, of our members have their diabetes under control. If you fall out of control, we enroll you in uh, this program. We, on average, drop your hemoglobin A1C by 2.4 in 100 days. Uh, the clinicians in this room know what that means. For those of you who are not clinicians, that's bat poop insane. That's an unbelievably massive level of reduction that is only possible if people change their behavior, right? And that's not an anecdote, that's the program-wide result, right? So we're in existence proof that actually seniors, when properly supported, will in fact shift their behavior to be healthier. And one key to our approach is basically taking a maniacally patient-centric approach. So with each of our members, we work with them to have them set a goal, a goal for their own health journey, uh, which we then document in our software and support them on. Um, I've looked at tons of these goals in our system, not a single goal that any member has ever set has been clinical. I can't think of a single member who said, my goal for my health journey is to drop my A1C by 1.2, right? The goals are, I wanna see the granddaughter I haven't yet met. I want when my grandson hugs me for his arms to go all the way around me. I wanna go gambling with my girlfriends on the riverboat. I wanna be home, not in the hospital at Christmas. I want to walk again. I want to kick a soccer ball, okay, right? And then we say, okay, you're the hero of your story. That is your goal that motivates you. We're gonna be your backup singers to help you achieve that goal. Um, and then that motivated member with that goal, with support, then achieves that goal and can achieve it at scale um, across the population. So I, I think there's a very dangerous thread of conventional wisdom in the American healthcare system that people won't change their behavior, right? They just wanna be sick, bullpucky, Right? What you're actually seeing is the learned helplessness of a population that's dealing with a ridiculously difficult, high friction, non patient system that makes it hard to get anything done, right? But people don't want to be sick. And if you support them in getting healthy, they will. Now that being said, we get people at 65 and say, holy crap, we really wish we'd gotten you when you were 20, right? Which is why we have to implement Guy's idea and Amy's idea, because <laughs> then we'll have dramatically better outcomes as a country and much lower cost. Um, I'm not an expert in the education system. Like, I don't know what to do there at all. Uh, but I do think that implementing what Guy and Amy are talking about is key um, and is uh, doable. And here's the thing, if we do it, then ultimately we're going to spend less money on healthcare and get better outcomes uh, over the medium to long run, so. Just to, just to pick up on that, and you know, since Maria's probably uh, uh, not going to talk about her own work. I think it actually speaks directly to what you say. So she has some excellent work with uh, Petra Pearson and, and Yi Chen 
it shows something that totally shocks me. So first of all, they look in Sweden, a country that not only has universal health insurance, but also has a cradle to the grave social safety net that's much more extensive than what we have. And yet they show if you look at, say, uh, life expectancy across the income distribution for 40 year olds, the, the sort of dramatically higher life expectancy at the top of the income distribution versus the bottom of the inc income distribution that we have in the US, you see that in Sweden too, of the same magnitude. And then they say, okay, so what is it that's driving it? It's clearly not social safety net or uh, health insurance. And they show, I mean, Maria can correct me if I'm wrong, but that access to expertise, so having a physician or a nurse practitioner in your family is correlated with having, exhibiting better health behaviors, you know, getting your checkups or your vaccinations, et cetera. Uh, so all of that is to say that I, I'm very optimistic that there, there are ways to encourage better health behaviors and that that's actually something that we have to do irrespective of, you know, buying my book and adopting my plan. <laughs> <laughs> the, the only thing I'll, I'll add, I know that the question was on the education system. The US does not have the same comprehensive social safety net that Sweden has. Um, and I think there's very good evidence, at least in my view, that giving health insurance to kids uh, helps improve health outcomes and lower costs decades later. Um, and this research comes in part from Medicaid expansions in the past, comparing people before and after sharp cutoffs. And I think there are a number of policies that states and the federal government can do even, even without getting to the education system, we probably should get there, but to make the current safety, current safety net more comprehensive. So for example, continuous eligibility. So a bunch of states have said, look, if you're poor at age one, we're not gonna make you requalify for Medicaid until you're age six, because we recognize that most poor people are gonna stay poor. We don't want, if their parents don't fill out a form or don't, you know, don't requalify, we don't want people to lose out on that PCP visit where they're gonna get their vaccines. Covering kids is really inexpensive. The Congressional Budget Office thinks that this pays for itself depending on the discount rates that you use. So I, I think there's a lot, I think there's a lot of really good stuff in that in that question, yeah. generally in helping make investments in children. Yeah, thank you for that fantastic question. Mark? Yeah, I just have a question for the back figure. I can I am the one calling, so maybe I'll <laughs> jump the line here a little bit. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, Guy, when you and I worked in the uh, Council of Economic Advisors back in 2009 and 2010, at the time the primary motivations for the Affordable Care Act were expand health insurance coverage and slow the growth rate of health care costs. Yeah. And from 2000 to 2010, health care as a share of GDP went from 13.3% to 17.2%. And at that time, the Congressional Budget Office was projecting that by 2020, 2022, the most recent year for which we have data as opposed to predictions, that uh, health care as a share of GDP would be 23%, a 6% of GDP increase. And yet, if you look at the most recent data in 2022, it's 17.3%. So what do you think happened? Yeah, it, I mean, and no one's really talking about I it. Know, that was, I and know. everyone said at the time I know. that ACA is going to do well at expanding health insurance coverage, but it's not doing anything to slow the growth rate of health care costs. So I'm just, yeah. I mean, I know that national time series analysis is not the way to do causal analysis. But in any case, your, um, your I think thoughts? It's, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked and happy uh, with, with the data that you're describing, Mark. And part of the reason that I'm so surprised is actually picking up what Amy said a little while ago, that a lot of the cost control measures, the pay differently for hip replacements and bundles and stuff like that, seems like they, at least micro scale, like haven't been all that successful. Um, and I think it's a real puzzle. Like I'm really, I'm really not sure what's going on. Um, I, I invite others to, to weigh in, but um, yeah. I also agree that it's, unbelievably important and shocking how little attention it's getting, both in the media, but also among academic research. Although that may be because having tried to do research on it, I, it, it's very hard. Like I haven't yet figured out a way, hopefully someone else will. So I don't know what's causing it. I'm puzzled like Guy, I will offer one piece of anecdata, which is the only other time period in modern history where there's been a slowdown in the growth of healthcare spending came uh, right after the uh, failed attempt at passing massive health care reform under the Clinton administration. And so, you know, that's only two data points, but it does make you wonder whether the threat or the actual implementation of major health insurance reform somehow 
gets, gets all the providers to take a sort of collective, oh, you know, threat of further regulation if, if something doesn't happen. I have no formal model for that, let alone any empirical evidence, but it is a striking fact, Oid. I think it's a huge opportunity for someone to figure this out. <laughs> and it's a hugely important question, right? Yeah. So I hope maybe someone in this room is going to figure that out. What is everyone spending that $5,000 extra a person on? Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's AI. Or, okay, we've got a question over here from John Gunn. Oh, wait, 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 with the microphones coming, John. <laughs> Great. Uh, just to go on Mark's thing, it, 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 harmful things. What's happened to smoking like in the last six years? No. Does anybody know? I don't know what's happened to smoking. I will say... It's, yes, <laughs> uh, but, but quitting smoking is. <laughs> um, but I will say that you know David Cutler has done research suggesting that some of this decline in the growth of well, I should say first of all, we know that 30 to 40 percent of it is literally because Medicare cut payment rates and therefore we're, we're, the price is lower. But David Cutler also has some work suggesting that related to the comments about prevention that improvements in the uh, uh, in cardiovascular medications have reduced, you know, the sort of the incidence of poor health and that that may be responsible for some of the slowdown as well. I don't know specifically about smoking per se. I don't know if someone else does. Yeah, sure. No, we'll have okay. to Additional uh, questions. We have a question right here from Hank, uh, another one of our board members. <clears throat> I want to press back a bit on uh, your statement, Amy, about the inevitable negative effect of controlling drug prices uh, on innovation. Uh, to put the matter tendentiously, I think your answer was a partial equilibrium answer to a general equilibrium question. In particular, U.S. drug prices, uh, and the reason these drugs were selected for negotiation, is that U.S. drug prices are dramatically higher than they are in other countries around the world. Uh, would you not expect that as the United States presses down a bit on uh, prices of these drugs, one of which I must say I take and I am bewildered at the retail price, which is not at the high end of many, but I, it's $900 for a three month supply for which I pay about 10% of that. Uh, would you not expect that as the United States negotiates down uh, the prices paid for the dozen or so drugs uh, on their list, uh, that the behavior of drug companies in dealing with the rest of the world uh, might also change? So that whatever discouraging effects on research uh, might have flowed if the United States were the only country in the world are likely to be attenuated by supply side responses vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world? That, that's a terrific question. Uh, I'm certainly guilty as charged that my statement was a, if all prices came down in partial equilibrium, that's what would happen. And certainly, if prices elsewhere, you know, in other countries went up, I, you, your point is very well taken. I'm not, I, mean, I guess I'm a little less optimistic than, the, uh, than you are that that would happen in the sense that pharmaceutical companies currently have incentives on the margin to negotiate as high a price as they can in any other country in, in other countries and I presume they're doing so so I'm not totally sure why they would be more successful or put more effort into it if prices were lower in the US but certainly you are completely right that if if prices rose other places what matters to the to the innovator is the expected profits, not whether they come from the US or from France. I agree completely with that. Okay, additional uh, question. We have a question right here. I don't know if this is accurate, but I believe it to be that because we're economics and it's supply and demand, I have been told that we have not built a new medical school in the US in like 30 years, and that that's because of the AMA puts a clamp on it somehow. Uh, or lobbies for it. Any comments about that? Because if you increase the supply of doctors, healthcare goes down. At least it should. I'm pretty sympathetic to that argument. Uh, I do believe uh, that there are various 
artificial restrictions built into the supply of, of, uh, of medical providers uh, through licensing, through the AMA, through also congressional funding for uh, an authorization of residencies. And I'm a big believer that if you uh, expand supply, that will drive prices down. Um, I think, as always with occupational licensing, the question is, you know, can you maintain, you know, quality control while doing so? My instinct is yes, but I, I don't know of the evidence on that. But yes, I, I think that's a very sensible policy. The, the, only, the only point I will add, when, when my sister uh, graduated from medical school, the, the dean had a very poignant moment where he said, the most expensive instrument you'll have is not the MRI machine, it's the pen. It's you know, the, the things that you'll order, the referrals that you'll make. Expanding the supply of providers may well be a good thing and may drive down the price. I'll just point out that total healthcare spending is prices times quantities. Um, so with more providers, you might get more care, and that may well be good care. Um, but I'm just pointing out that the, the, the effect on total spending is probably un unclear from, from expanding the supply. OK, one, one last still... question right here from Fred. Uh, uh, right here. Uh, sorry, right here. Sorry. No, no, right up here. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Yep. Look, look in front of and I'd, I'd like to follow up on uh, Hank's uh, question. It's a variant of it. Uh, to what extent uh, would you characterize that we have a form of free rider problem in the rest of the world with respect to American pharma innovation, which is uh, protected under patent? Uh, offers an opportunity for monopoly rent extraction and the management of the flow of uh, U.S. pharma IP outside of the U.S. Uh, might uh, be a public good issue for the world and for the United States. I'll start, and I, I should say, of the people in this room, I, I'm confident I'm not the the biggest expert, Lisa in the, in the red, has thought a lot more about this than I have. But I, I would say it's definitely the, the case that um, pharmaceutical development, as Amy said, is, is a worldwide, there was a worldwide market for, for big pharmaceuticals. And if one country, the US, uh, pays more, uh, that can be a driver of innovation for the rest of the world. And I think it's absolutely a public good, uh, exactly the way that you described. I agree completely. And the flip side is the, the consequences of lowering prices in the U.S. may, may occur not just for uh, U.S. patients, but around the world as well. Looks like we're uh, essentially out of time, so please join me in thanking our terrific panel, Maria, Guy, Amy, and Todd.